Hello, and welcome to part two of this Anatomy of a Instrument performance. <laughs> Hopefully this will be um, more musical and more fun than part one, which was very much focused on the uh, uh, technical synth setup, Ableton setup, and that sort of thing. But if you're interested in that kind of thing, you should check out part one. There's a little uh, of this going on. Got a expression pedal controlling my feedback level. And it's a little weird because I'm also using a microphone to speak for the video, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> for this video is to um, talk about how I construct one of these improvisations and how I practice for it. First important thing is I want every one of them to be at least a little bit different than all the others. Uh, part of how I do that is uh, what sound I build for it, so that'll be the first step in the process usually. Another important thing is the scale that I decide to use. Right now I'm using one called Mela, Rel Mela Ramapriya, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, I've never heard anybody say it. It, here's my C. That's my root note. I've got a flat second, major third, um, augmented fourth, regular fifth, major sixth, and a minor seventh. And these are the notes that I have lit on the instrument. I have a love-hate relationship with the lights because they really, they're really helpful, but they also kind of, they really draw the fingers to them. And because for this performance, I don't want to be thinking about what notes I'm allowed to play. I'm just going to lean into that. I've set up the notes that I want, and my fingers will just go to them, and I won't think about it very much. And the problem with this approach is if you want to do something with a lot of key changes, or different scales in it, things like that. In that case, you're better off sticking to a standard light setup rather than one that's custom made for your uh, performance. So I go back and forth, and right now I'm. This is what I'm doing, um, and I might also. I might throw in one unlit note, which is my. Minor third. And then uh, I might exchange that with the major third, or I might um, use them both. And if I use them both, then I don't have Mela Ramapriya anymore. I just have an octatonic scale, which is also pretty cool and fun. <laughs> Once I've got my sound and my scale set up, I will do 
a lot of noodling, to which I will, I'm sure, be treating you to plenty of examples. <laughs> And if I'm using an atypical scale like this one, I'll sometimes spend some time just practicing playing around with that scale in one position, um, the most natural position for it. Oh, I also I wanted to mention that I am tuned in fifths. So this is my C, then this is my G. And I build my chords by stacking fifths and sixths. the scale in a natural position first for a moment. And so for this one, turns out it's easiest to play using two fingers on the left hand for the first two notes, and three in the right, one on the left, three in the right. scale in the process of the, or in the body of the piece, but it's good to know. But your fingers know where to go. Another thing I will do is, um, I'm always looking for a variety of different things because my hands are just going to do what they want to do. So I need to like sort of set my brain into a different mode for each of the things that my hands want to do. So one of them is just a one row playing. demonstrates one of the reasons that I like to play in channel per row is that those my rows are all set up to be monophonic sounds so it's like a string on a guitar that gives me I think cleaner and nicer legato lines and it sounds faster and better <laughs> when I want polyphony, I can just use the other rows as well. Although, because I'm using 
heaps of distortion it's going to give it, you know, that distorted guitar sound. <laughs> Arpeggiating the very cor the various chord shapes, and the chords, of course, are all really easy to see because they're just the lit buttons, right? <laughs> those two ideas together, um, I guess something like this. continue noodling on this for hours and days. Um, and I'll be looking for new patterns, new arpeggios that I'm not used to playing. Um, anything different. Um, if you see, if you've watched my playing and you think, man, he does that thing a thousand times. I assure you that I've done it a million times and we all have our problems. So I'm looking for I'm looking for new things and if I find something new I will practice it a bunch of times so that it will work its way into the next performance. And if there's something I notice I'm doing way too much like this. I'll try to break myself of that habit if I can. It can be difficult. Some of those things sound really cool and you don't want to break the habit, but you also don't want to play just that thing for the entire performance. <laughs> Perform these is I have poles that I move back and forth between. Like I have, you know, the usual high and slow, high and low, fast and slow, arpeggiation or melodic. I need to try to. I'm going to work on some slow stuff for a bit. Thank you. 
those slow parts in there and be more thoughtful with them than you would be with the faster parts. I forget to do that sometimes. Another thing I like to do, when I, especially on the slow bits, is really emphasize the uh, the expressiveness of each note. Do a lot of vibrato, bend, um, whatever you tilt, whatever you call this when you'd use the Y axis. I've also got the expression pedal helping me out. stuff that I do is um, I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing to be honest so it's hard to slow it down and play it for you um, but I've got and again I'm bouncing between these arpeggio shapes slides and melodic shapes <laughs> got this um I was tracing out this this arpeggio here it was just a bunch of other garbage notes around it to do, which I will try to do in the process of this session, I like to have one motif or something that I can return to as sort of a home base to give an identity to the piece. And lately I've used some arpeggios for that, tracing out some chord patterns. The one I'm using for this, that I, I like the first two chords, I don't like it after that, so that's something I need to work on. It goes like this. Oh, sorry, like this. It's also one surprisingly hard to play in tune. Um, I don't understand why. Maybe it's because it's diminished by nature, so my ear is not sure whether it's out of tune or just being what it is. Um, I play with pitch quantization turned off because it feels more natural to me, so that means sometimes I'm just not in tune. <laughs>
In this fifths tuning, pretty much anything that looks kind of like a vertical line will be a chord of some sort. So. because this kind of, there's a metal character to this sound and scale. I want to have some kind of, uh, not exactly arpeggios, but um, fast patterns that can repeat, that can move around and use in different places. So one of them I'm working on is this. things like it a bit more before I record the performance so I can throw them in and they'll be cool in places. <laughs> uh, here's another new practice pattern I've been working with. I don't think it's going to... nothing more than a fragment is going to show up in the piece, but um, I think it's a good exercise to uh, train your train your expressiveness and also your um train your thought process what do i mean by that i'm not sure yeah you you think about things differently when you're doing this technique and that's just to play with one finger and you'll use a lot of slide and move around in different ways and it's just um very limited compared to other playing that you would do and you have to think of different patterns to keep it interesting teach you to use more silence in your piece, which I need to do. to a regular practice routine to do it with different fingers and whatnot so that you can strengthen up these skills wherever you need them. My middle finger on my right hand is the best for doing this and the others I rarely do it with. So. when you're doing something that you're not used to. chimey sounds going on. I've explained those in part one of this. Um, that's just a random arpeggiator playing octaves on whatever note I'm doing, and it's got 
a random delay time on it so the sounds will kind of come in here and there. Interesting thing about it is it will only play the note that I've actually played, the pad that I touched, and not wherever I've slid to, so I can get some harmonies going on with that. feedback again. It can go kind of nuts. But I like that it fills up the space between things that I play. some drones underneath. That's a thing I like to do. Works really well with this um, improvisation in one scale sort of form. Um, so I've got, I can start the drones with um, this split over here. Um, so these are set up. This one stops at, this plays a C, this plays a G, this plays a D flat, and this plays an A. And the, uh, as you'll hear, the scale that I'm playing will take on a different character depending on which of these is going.
Yeah, so that's how I'll practice, and I'll practice a bunch. Get these things really comfortable under my fingers, and then when I do the performance, I will kind of make it up as I go. Pull these things out of my fingers where they feel appropriate. And because the instrument is so easy to play, especially when the lights are telling you exactly what notes to play, you can really... Um, you can really focus on building a structure as you're improvising, um, again, without having to think about what notes you're playing and things like that. You can take like a, a higher level view of everything and build it as you go, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, I guess that's about it. Uh, thank you for watching.